All right. I'm here with Caitlin to talk about Hackers for Hire. But first, we want to talk about a new ink, because I hear my inks are very popular on this uh, podcast. So today, I want to talk about Irban's uh, Rose Granat, which is a wonderful shade of red. You now, can't be pronouncing that right. Is that French or something? Yeah, it's like Rose, ro, ro, yeah, Rose Granat. It, yeah, um, yeah, oh, R O U Rouge, Rouge, yes, oh, Rouge, okay. Grenat, yeah, okay, yeah, Rouge, Rouge, red something. yeah, it's it's a ruby, ruby type red, yeah, that is, yeah, yeah that does spell Rouge, I don't know, anyway, especially <laughs> <laughs> how much I know, anyway, but no, th- this thing I think is underrated, so this is by Airbond, so so there's there's two Airbonds, there's Jacques Airbond, which is their premium inks. And regular Airbon, which is like their basic consumer level cheapo inks. But this one's really good because last time I talked about inks, I talked about the venerable Con Pecky, which is that blue ink with the shading. This is like that, but in red. Oh. So I'm also going to give people a little pro tip. So this is one of my favorite, favorite pens that I've ever bought. This is a Chinese special cheapo uh, wooden pen. So I don't know if this is a knockoff or what. But it's an awesome pen. Uh, and I have it inked up with the red because it's like a red wood, right? Like it, they go together. Uh, so I'll give a quick writing sample of what it looks like. Uh, All right. So I'm going to write right here. Ready, everyone? Oh, this is hard to write like this. Sorry. I doesn't want to write. Oh, I should have prepared ahead of time. There we go. Okay. So, oh gosh, you can't see. Just a little bit. Yeah, no. Oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah you don't get the, uh, the yeah. brilliance I, of it. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd have to get a special thing. But no, it's just like, it's a dark red. Mm-hmm. So it, it looks nice on paper, but it also has a slight sh- shading to it. So it's not just like a straight red. Which is, I think, a little boring, um, and it's it's dark red, a little bit like diamine oxblood, if you know what that is. But it just has a little bit more shading. So that's my my ink for today. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, there was an ancient time, believe it or not, when I used to get like quizzes from students on paper, and then I would like mark it up with pens and give it back to them. This strange ancient ritual, sort of like you know people exchanging rocks in the Stone Ages. Yeah, no. So what's really funny is that, you know, people are like, why, why all this like fancy writing equipment in the 21st century? We do everything on the computer. Exactly. You, the only time you write is when it's very personal or very special. So, yeah. so you know, you, 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 you know, find instruments that you like and you find inks that you like and you make it very personal. And like this one, I, like I said, I just love this pen because like I said, it's, I don't even know the brand. It's, you know, the Chinese special cheapo knockoff. I don't even know if it's a knockoff of anything. I don't know any major brands that make wooden pens, but this is a wooden pen. It has the exact perfect weight. It has a great feel. It feels organic. I love the feel of the the wood. It writes well enough. <laughs> I mean, it for a, you know, $20 knockoff Chinese special, but it's it's up there with my like $200, you know, Lamy 2000s and um, you, you know, vanishing point pens that, you know. Yeah, reminds yeah. me of those videos I've seen of, I think in Japan where they get a brush and there's this whole big deal of like writing the characters just right with the brush. If you want me to do next time uh, some of my calligraphy brushes, yeah, yeah, that's true. I we, we could definitely go over calligraphy brushes. Uh, they're not easy to work with. They are it's not. important in tech. This is what app, this is what Steve Jobs said when they, Gave a commencement address. He said he changed his life because he went to Harvey Mudd and they taught him calligraphy. And he said, yeah. I learned we can make things beautiful. We don't have to make everything blocky and square and functional. And that's how he made all the Apple products. That is absolutely correct. You can learn. And like I grew up with really bad handwriting. All my teachers complained. No one could read. Uh, now my handwriting, everyone's like, wow, you got such beautiful handwriting. That is a learned thing. Like you, like no one taught me in school, like the, every, like the way, 
writing is taught. It's here's how to write an A, here's how to write a B. No one teaches you like it should be art, but it is an art. Well, you know, I I found I always had the same problem. There were most terrible writing in the world, and then I. I met a man and he just wrote very slowly. And I tried it. If you write slowly and carefully, you can write really well. I've seen not rush. Yes. I've, I've seen some calligraphers, this one calligrapher who can make uh, her writing look exactly like a typewriter, but she writes about one character, you know, every three seconds, like, you know, very carefully. Uh, You know, it's, yeah. yeah, you slow down and, and then you, you have a style. So you, you learn things like what a sheriff is and whether or not you want to put it in your writing. Um, and, you know, maybe you've heard things like fonts being sans sheriff. That means without the sheriff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like little squigglies at the end. Uh, and you can have different, you know, typographies that you can use in your your everyday writing. Uh, but like I said, it's it's an art. It really is. And, and you just have to sit down and learn how you want your, your letters to look. And then practice, 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 um, and just treat it like you're drawing, not that not like you're writing. Um yeah. and, and that's what they don't teach you in school. And that's what makes writing a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and I think basically Americans are always like optimizing efficiency and sort of rushing through things. Yep. And not taking time to do things carefully often enough. It's a uh... It's a character, a national character. Yeah, I, I had a friend in college who did a lot of calligraphy, um, and I'm like, oh, that sounds really dumb and boring. And here I am with my set of calligraphy brushes and yeah. <laughs> you know, fountain pens and all this fun stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a matter of appreciation. Yes. So, anyway, uh, for the news, uh, there's an article uh, here at freespeech.com somebody's blog but the point is i can is making trouble again i can is the internet commission in charge of assigning names and numbers they handle domain names and they're just constantly a storm of controversy and skullduggery and underhanded moves and so they're changing their terms of service so that if any government issues any request they can take over a domain name and they say this would mean county governments china iran North Korea, I mean, governments you probably really don't want to obey. And right now, it would only be the .NET domain names. They say if this flies under the radar, they'll probably make it all domain names. So uh, that's a thing to be aware of. Uh, They've done so many sleazy things. And it looks like they're trying to do another one. Uh, And you've got insecure code from ChatGPT. You mean ChatGPT is unreliable? Well, no, it, it is quite reliable. It's reliable in making insecure code. <laughs> it's, well, uh, I think it's just as good as like if you went to um, Stack Exchange and just copied stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it's just like that. Um, so the article is on the register, although it is referencing this paper, which is on the Archive uh, from Cornell University, uh, about how secure is code generated by ChatGPT. Well, a group of researchers asked ChatGPT to make a few programs, including an FTP server. And it turns out that, yeah, it does not generate secure code unless you ask it, you know, like, is this code secure? Is this, you know, is this good? Uh, but by default, ChatGPT gives insecure code. And, and I mean, for good reason. If you're looking for a quick summary of how to do something, Secure code isn't necessarily the best. In fact, yesterday I had ChatGPT make a quick script for me to convert host addresses into, or host names into IPs and Bash scripts, which is a very simple thing. Um, but um, I noticed that there was a command line injection right in the thing that ChatGPT gave me, which is fine. I don't care. It's just something I'm running for myself. I'm not putting it in front of customers. But if I if I were an actual coder, uh, trying to like make something for consumers, you know, having these glaring security holes would be a big problem. Well, what would happen if you asked ChatGPT to write this code securely? Um, it's that's a good question. So, but, so the way it the way it works is that apparently you have it write code, and then you ask it to to see if there's any security vulnerabilities within the code, and then it will you know sort of tell you. Um, I, I, I it, it's hard. I mean, it, it's such a vague thing, like write code securely. 
right? Like, I'm not entirely sure even ChatGPT knows, can say that, but if it says, you know, if you ask it, are there any security vulnerabilities in this code? You can say, well, yes, there's, you know, command line injection or there's buffer overflows, you know, and then you can ask it, okay, how do I fix this? But most of the time when you want a, you know, piece of code or example code, you don't necessarily want it to care because that adds a lot of overhead yeah. to the code. You know, you have to, you know, um, sanitize the strings. Um, you have to, you know, make sure that the input doesn't exceed a certain length, you know, stuff like that. And you know, it it's not necessarily better to make secure code is what I'm saying for right. every single time. But if you are if you are lazy and you're and you are depending on ChatGPT to do the thinking for you, that's going to lend you into some some issues. And I must say, this is the same thing you get if you ask a computer coder to write code. Right. It's so I think I think the literacy of the future is going to be learning how to use these tools. So I was just considering um, what if my students are writing their, they have to write some little papers and some of them might be using ChatGPT to write the paper. And I'm not sure I want to discourage that. I no. just want to include it and say, you know, we really ought to be learning how to use these things. Yeah. And no, it's I've... like asking a junior assistant to do something. They do it, but then you have to review it and correct it because it's not going to be done very well. Yeah. No, I used uh, ChatGPT in a real world scenario. Um, a few days ago, I was asked to write a uh employee review type thing. And I'm like, okay, I, I wrote a paragraph. I need to expand it out. And then, so I just asked chat GPT, could you expand this out for me? Um, because it's, it's a little brief and I kind of want to add more, more flair to it. Um, and chat GPT did a good job. And I was like, okay, perfect. Copy paste. And I'm like, here, you know, me and chat GPT wrote this up and people were like, this is, you know, how, like, I, that's like so rude, like use chat GPT to write this. So I'm like, this is exactly what chat GPT this is an exact perfect use case for ChatGPT, you know, to not use it to write for me, but to, you know, work with ChatGPT, you know, to make a, a product, to, to get I, a piece of If yeah. I was given that job, I would Google and find an example yeah. and base my work on that, which is all ChatGPT is doing. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's this idea that ChatGPT is doing the work for you. Which, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're like, just write whatever ChatGPT, ChatGPT will do it. But when you use ChatGPT, you know, as a tool alongside the work that you're doing, I mean, that's that's a legitimate use of the of ChatGPT as far as I can tell. But, you know, it's just, it's, un, un, it's new territory. And we're all going to be doing it. Every tool is going to come with AI built into it. And you're just going to get used to this. Well, except Google, apparently, because they're having so many problems with their AI. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to watch. I mean, Google seems to have grown to where they're not agile anymore and they really can't develop new products very well. They they mm -hmm. probably have all this technical debt holding them back, but they're really behind on this. Yeah. It reminds me of when Microsoft stumbled because of the internet. They yeah. didn't think the internet mattered and they neglected it until other people got ahead and they never really caught up. Nope. All right. Well, um, there's an article out um, from N. CSC from the UK, the National Cybersecurity Center, saying that um, keep pay, hackers for hire are going to be selling tools like the uh, hack, phone hacking tool Pegasus. They're going to be making more of them and selling them cheaper to more and more people so that APT levels of hacking will become more common and available commercially. And I'm and they say there are thousands of people have been hacked by these advanced tools. And I'm seeing them. I got students coming to me with stories of how they've been hacked and they seem quite believable now. And so I think I'm seeing the shadows of this. L lower value targets are being hacked by these powerful tools. And uh, we can just expect more and more of that. So I, I think they're right. And I think it's already happening. Uh, and it's only logical. I mean, the stuff that used to be the domain of military, maybe five years ago with the APT actors is now percolating down through the uh, ecosystem to where lower level attackers can afford that stuff and use it. So hopefully we can come up better defenses, but uh, I've got several students that are extremely limited in their life because they're constantly being hacked and they can't trust their accounts and they can't use normal operating systems, normal machines. And you know, I am i don't think they're making it up. I think there are people who have offended someone moderately important and now they're getting hacked with the kind of attacks that used to only happen to like a national security journalist or something. 
So one good thing is the iPhone uh, super secure mode they just added apparently works to some extent to stop these attacks, but but there's nothing that really stops them very well. Anyway, then you've got, uh, oh yeah, satellite failure affecting farmers. Yeah, I'm very interested in this because of course I do a lot of work with uh, satellite security. Um, and let me pull up the article right here. So the article is on the Sydney Morning Herald and is written by Mike Foley. And a bunch of tractors and farm equipments have been unable to do their work. And this is prime planting seasons for like uh, legumes and a few other crops. Um, yeah, oats, canola, wheat, um, etc. And they can't plant right now because of a quote unquote GPS outage. Now, this is a little weird because normally when I think of GPS, I think of the GNSS constellations, the sort of multinational medium Earth orbit um, satellites that sort of beam down time and position data. Uh, that's not actually what happened. Uh, apparently, it was a problem with Inmarsat. So Inmarsat is a geostationary satellite that's used all over the world. I mean, they have a few Inmarsats positioned all around the planet. And they serve as sort of functional hubs for communication. Uh, so for example, like aircraft at sea uh, can get air traffic control information from Inmarsats. Now, apparently these tractors are using some sort of navigation provided by Inmarsat, even though it's a geostationary satellite. Um, and it's, apparently it's only one satellite too. So I don't understand how this is working. I'm looking at the the Wikipedia page here for uh, you know GPS information on Inmarsat. Uh, it's not uncommon for satellites to have GPS um, integrated so that they know where they are. Uh, although not for geostationary satellites, um, but apparently they do. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, it's hard to understand why they would need that. Yeah. System. I think all they need is an idea where they are. It's not like they're going to drive fast and nearly collide or something. Well, one of the things you can do with Inmarsat is you can have basic two-way communication so that you can have your tractors communicating with the rest of the farm, figuring out where we're you know, communicating with each other, bouncing off the satellite, that kind of stuff. Like I said, I'm not quite sure how the GPS works. Someone who knows Inmarsat better than I do might might be able to clue me in uh, yeah. about using Inmarsat for positioning, but apparently it went down and uh, people can't do their crops without Inmarsat. This seems to be a real trend in modern devices is to make them smart, add a bunch of extra functionality you don't need, and make it so they can't run without that. Well, as far as I can tell, this is pretty basic functionality. You need to be able, if you're automating your tractors to plant for you, they need to know where they are. Well, sure, but they're not getting that from Inmarsat. Apparently they are. That's that's what the article is, is proclaiming. Okay. Well, that's true. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I know. So it says, yeah, the, the GPS guidance of our systems that eliminate overlapping in row seeds uh, and over application of chemicals uh, is down. That's what they're saying. But they're saying it's it's also in Marsat. Well, um, you know, I know the commercial GPS is not accurate enough for that job. Right. It's like uh, ten or twenty yards of randomness. Yeah. So I'm thinking. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how the yeah. GPS works on in Marsat. I'll have to look more into that. But it yeah, but it does I mean, show. Yeah, I mean, when when you have a constellation, and I think you're right, Sam. Like you know, it's this was designed specifically around in Marsat, and yeah. so it does not have backups to work with any other GNSS system. Well, so if, I mean, I yeah. would have thought, what's the chance the satellite will go down? The satellite did the satellite go down? Um, not the whole satellite, just the part that is oh. required for the for the functioning of, of the tractors. So. Well, I probably would have been fooled by that too. I would think that the chance of a satellite going down is very small. I would think it's actually very high. Um, satellites break down all the time. Oh. All the time. It, it is a harsh environment in space and you can't go up there and just replace parts. Uh, mm -hmm. So for example, they just put up a new Goes West. Uh, the the It's the... So yeah. you you know of NOAA the NOAA yeah, the lower yeah geo but they have the geostationary ones yeah they just put up a new one uh, because the one they put up like four or five years ago already went all faulty 
<laughs> so the radiation destroys the chips, right? Yeah, exactly. The radiation yeah. and the harsh environment. It, and they can't put enough shielding around it, apparently. Nope. And, and you know, just they, they have a limited lifespan. Um, you can't. Anyway, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Don't. The, the, the moral of the story is don't rely on a single satellite. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing I guess the designers need to learn is that satellites have a high failure rate. I, I wouldn't have guessed that. My first thought is they're far away from humans intruding on them and rain and stuff. And so what can happen? But apparently stuff can happen. Yeah. Apparently being in like constant sunlight 24 seven, you know, isn't good for, for machines, especially when they're designed to be as light and flimsy as possible. Well, yeah. All right. And uh, there's a bunch of clips from a new wearable from a company called Humane. They've uh, he demonstrated it at a TED talk, and some people think this may be a big wearable that's really going to take off. Um, it is. It looks like a small cell phone. It looks kind of like an old pager, those small things, and it runs independent. It's not connected to a cell phone, and it takes voice commands. And so on stage, he asked it, uh, "Catch me up on my schedule," and it says, "You've got an appointment at three and." Somebody moved their appointment at four to a different day or something. And then he can get a phone call and receive the phone call and project things onto his hand to read them. There's no screen, but it can project onto a nearby object and it takes voice command. And uh, it also, he was able to hold up a candy bar and it will scan the candy bar and then give you nutritional analysis of whether you should be eating that or not based on its knowledge of your medical history. So, you know, it sounds to me like... Um, it does the same kind of thing people are currently doing with smartphones, but it might be a more convenient, more easy way to do this. And uh, I think we've all been waiting for wearables that really work. Uh, it's been in science fiction for a while where you just wear some little object and it does amazing things. And somehow it's never quite caught on Google Glass. and But somebody is going to make a wearable that really works and they're going to make a pile of money. So this may be it. Anyway, and you've got like something wrong with Elon Musk. Another unthinkable thought. Yeah, so I, I, this never crossed my mind, uh, but a, a bit ago, and I think we talked about this on the podcast. Elon Musk uh, said that NPR is a state-sponsored news program because they get money from the government, and uh, yes, one percent of NPR's operating budget does come from grants from the government. <laughs> um, and, and there's there's barriers to prevent them from controlling the content. Right, exactly, and and so the the government can't control the content, you know. It's it's you know it's yeah. There's a lot I could say about NPR, and I think I've mentioned it before, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, uh, but NPR, I was amazed when a friend of mine who's uh, on the right said, "Oh, I'll play some liberal news for you," and he plays NPR. They regard that as like fanatic liberal, which is where Elon Musk is now. But I yeah. think that's ridiculous. I think NPR is the most centrist, unbiased news you can get pretty much. That, that's the problem. If you are bombarded with right wing talking points 24 seven, centrist viewpoints become seem to look very leftist. Yeah. Right. If you're like, you know, oh, the, you know, uh, Biden is the worst person in the world. And, you know, he's going to destroy America. And then you have a centrist perspective of like, Biden gave a speech today. People clapped. <laughs> you know, like he accomplished things and he, yeah, he did some things. And, it was a good thing. <laughs> yeah, some people say it was good. Some people say it was bad. Yeah. Um, suddenly, that looks like leftist propaganda. I mean, it's and and plus, um, NPR likes to do a lot of uh, sort of personal interest stories where they interview people who are doing sort of interesting things, like. Um, you know, fighting for, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, and they, they don't really take a stand to Black Lives Matter, but they find it very interesting that these people, you know, want to, and, and they also do like, I remember one of my favorite NPR stories was they interviewed an elf from a, from a Christmas, uh, like a, what, like a Santa, like a mall Santa elf. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I didn't like, even know there were elves. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. They interviewed a mall Santa elf you know, ones like they, they do those human interest stories a lot. And, um, and if you are used to your news, just demonizing all these people, and now you have this news organization humanizing people, you know, once again, it looks like left-wing propaganda when it is just centrist, you know, mm -hmm. and being centrist. Anyway, uh, so Elon Musk, as you said, is in this camp of being sort of inundated with right-wing talking points to the point where 
He thinks that NPR is a state-sponsored news media and because they get money from the government. And the the insights that I kind of want to point out um, is that uh, Tim Fernholtz uh, over at quartz.com, uh, uh, qz.com, uh, Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX and Tesla, so his companies, get more money from the government than NPR. So if you want to talk about state-sponsored people, it's Elon Musk. <laughs> I mean, with uh, especially with like SpaceX, uh, the government is one of his, you know, biggest customers. And of course, with Tesla and his green vehicles, uh, he gets a bunch of government incentives for making sure that we're moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, so if you want to talk about someone who has an incentive with the government, it is Elon Musk, not NPR. NPR gets most of its money from like the endowments for the arts and and like 1% of its budget comes from the government, but that's it. And there are strict rules that the US government can't tell it what it can and can't broadcast. Um, so yeah, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and, and by the way, um, I don't know if people saw this, but there was a launch of uh, the Starship, the new right. Starship, and it was a complete failure. Didn't even get to like second stage. Blew up mid-flight, ruined people's cars and everything. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but if if you're wondering if you're if you're wondering if it's possible for Elon Musk to blow something up faster than he did Twitter, yes. Right now he's at forty seconds. <laughs> yeah, they're they're saying it was a success. They say it went as far as they expected it to, or something. But anyway, uh. Uh, well, I mean, it's a prototype, and right. one of the nice things about being a being not in the space industry for you know sixty years is that you know, you're getting your feet wet, and you can just blow things up. If like the SLS blew up on its launch, even without anyone on it, you know NASA would be like take a huge hit, and they would get defunded. Everything has to be perfect. There's no room for errors. But if you're a private industry, and you just want to just get data, um, you know, why not just blow up some rockets? It's cool. The article I read said that he's on track to provide uh, space travel much cheaper. They said he can, he'll be able soon to send a payload to any planet in the solar system for 50 million bucks, which like at least Mars anyway, which sounds pretty crazy, but that's, that's what they predicted. And they said it's going to actually create some space tourism. You yeah, well, buy a ticket on something that won't be ridiculously expensive. Yeah, no one's going to want to buy a ticket to Mars. <laughs> well, I hope not. Yeah. Actually, there's a whole bunch of people volunteering to fly to Mars because they just sound so great. They haven't realized what it really would be like. Yeah, no, that's you would spend at least six months. Oh, yeah. Probably more. Uh, one way, one way, by the way. And get a uh, lethal radiation dose. Get a lethal radiation dose. And, and by the way, these things are tight. Uh, like very small, like you'd yeah. basically be in a a single like smaller room, smaller than this area, smaller than my apartment. Like like the imagine being stuck in an airplane in in coach and economy class for six months straight. Then you get to Mars, and then I don't know if they're going to land or whatever. But then you have to wait for another window for Earth to to do a home and transfer to Earth. Uh, so I don't know that might take another year. <laughs> <laughs> um and so you know like three years would pass before you can get back to home yeah then, yeah not fun and not then, fun and then you're a wreck you're, you're dying of cancer or something you're dying of cancer you've been stuck on a, a you know in zero g for a year so you your know your bones yeah your muscles, muscles and everything are all messed up yep your, and your bones <laughs> yep and not only that um, ignoring the radiation, the deadly radiation, ignoring the deadly bone density loss, ignoring the muscle loss, ignoring the heart disease, you know, ignoring all that fun stuff. Um, one of the things that happens when you go into zero gravity is that the fluids, you know, like don't sink down anymore. So you get all bloated. So if you have like, if you think allergies are bad, <laughs> you basically have like 24 seven allergies, your face gets all bloated, you know, it's just uncomfortable. Um, and it smells bad because no one can shower. Yeah. It's uh, staying here is the cool thing to do. It is.
Yep. And there are no cats in, in space yet. Well, you could bring a cat, but I don't think it would improve things very much. Oh, I think I think that cat would just love to go to space. Oh, probably. Might do better than a human. Yes. But you know what you really ought to have is pet cockroaches. They could probably tolerate the radiation better. And the zero gravity. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. And I think I'll be at B-Sides tomorrow. So I put up the logo. Okay. But anyway, um, well, I guess that's it for this one. And we'll have another one on Tuesday. Perfect. All right.